Ambassador Gopi, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. I'm uh, pleased to join you for the South Asian Diaspora Convention again. This is an important platform that brings together members of the South Asian Diaspora from around the world to network, exchange ideas, create more opportunities, and for all of us present to understand more about what's going on in this very important region. I thank Ambassador Gopinath Pile and the Institute of South Asian Studies for their hard work in organizing this meaningful event. I last spoke at the convention or this convention six years ago, and a lot has changed since then in the world, in technology, so many things. It's almost unrecognizable in some ways. In several countries, trade and foreign investment have become a lightning rod for economic inequality and various social issues, rather than as a contributor to growth and economic well-being. Restrictions have been placed on technology and sourcing, and this has disrupted global integrated logistics and supply chains. These disruptions and uncertainties have cast a pall over global economic outlook. So will we continue on a path of greater multilateral trade liberalization and integration, which we had been moving along for the last half a century at least? Or will we see more restrictions, tariffs and barriers placed on technology, trade and investment? And what does this mean for all of us? Will we live in a more integrated world or will we live in a bifurcated or fragmented world? So we need to understand these forces and work together to build a region and world that will bring greater collective long-term benefits for our people. South Asia and its diaspora, which at 41 million is the largest in the world, have an important role to play. South Asia itself has emerged as one of the most dynamic regions in the world with tremendous growth potential. The region accounts for more than one-fifth of the world population and enjoys a demographic dividend with its youthful population. Real GDP growth in the region has steadily increased from an average of about 3% per annum in the 1970s to over 7% in the last decade. And over 200 million South Asians have been lifted out of poverty in the last three decades. So today, South Asia contributes to over 15% of global growth, with India being the fastest growing major economy in the world. And South Asia's diaspora has played a large part in and benefited from the opportunities provided by a more integrated world. And many of you here today represent that. You've contributed to a more integrated world and you've benefited from it as well. Your professionals and companies in major fields such as IT, finance and trade play important roles in many countries. And your scientists, engineers, writers contribute to the advance of human knowledge. However, global growth and growth in South Asia cannot be taken for granted and could be affected by both domestic factors and external factors. In the face of the global economic slowdown, the Asian Development Bank has already lowered South Asia's growth projection for this year from 6.6% to 6.2%. Singapore and other countries in our region have also not been spared. So what can we all do together to help the region overcome its challenges, realize its full potential, and uplift the livelihood and well-being of our people. So I would like to, just for purposes of discussion, suggest three ways in which the South Asian diaspora can play a significant role. And we can talk about the ideas and thoughts that you have later on as well. So I would like to suggest three things. Enhancing economic links, strengthening connectivity, and developing people. First, enhancing economic links. The diaspora are natural advocates and supporters with useful networks that South Asian countries can leverage 
to promote closer economic cooperation within the region and with other regions. Trade expansion creates more opportunities for growth. Larger markets, greater ability to leverage the comparative advantages of the workforce in each of our societies, and foreign investments that bring capital, technology, and jobs. Regional integration has been a powerful force for growth in many regions. In Southeast Asia, here in Southeast Asia, countries were able to resolve or set aside significant bilateral differences and focus on development. Part of this was the impetus that countries saw in their neighbours, that peace, stability, openness had brought prosperity and progress, rapid prosperity and progress for their neighbours in the region. And these became good examples and an impetus for countries to resolve differences that they may have and go onwards on the path of progress as well. And this provides the foundation for greater economic integration, often with free trade agreements where businesses and people can prosper together. There remains much scope for South Asia to exploit this potential. Let me look at some data. The volume of intra-regional trade in South Asia, South Asia remains low, even after the 2004 South Asian Free Trade Area or SAFTA Agreement. Intra-regional trade accounts for just 5% of South Asia's total trade, compared to 24% for ASEAN in 2015. International trade also remains a relatively low share of GDP in South Asian countries, especially when compared to developing nations in the East Asia and Pacific region. According to a joint study by the World Bank and the International Labour Organization this year, merchandise exports in South Asia account for less than 10% of GDP compared to over 20% in East Asia and the Pacific and 30% in Europe and Central Asia. So these differences are not small ones, both in intra-regional trade and in international trade. There are significant differences. Southeast Asia and South Asia are geographically contiguous and are natural partners. So there are many opportunities. We already have the ASEAN India Free Trade Area, which came into effect in 2010. But there is a lot more potential for growth and partnership. Negotiations for the RCEP, the Regional Corporate Comprehensive Economic Partnership, concluded on the sidelines of the recent ASEAN Summit in Bangkok. We hope that India and the other 15 countries in RCEP can overcome the outstanding issues so that India can come on board eventually. We look forward to the region, including India, moving ahead together as one. Second, strengthening connectivity. One key area is infrastructure, which provides the sinews for development and growth, power, telecommunications, roads, railways, ports, airports, but also water, sanitation. South Asian countries face a significant infrastructure gap. According to a study by the ADB, the region needs an average investment of about 365 billion US dollars per year to meet an infrastructure, its infrastructure needs between 2016 and 2030. And this is equivalent to about 7.5% of the region's projected GDP every year. When we take into account climate mitigation and adaptation costs, the figure rises to 420 billion US dollars per year in annual average investment in infrastructure, or 8.6% of the region's projected GDP. Now, we all know that infrastructure projects require a lot of investment, a high cost, and it's often not possible for governments, South Asian governments, to finance these projects on their own. And so governments need to find ways to mobilize capital 
from private sector, from multilateral institutions to plug the gap. Singapore has set up Infrastructure Asia, an open platform for better, to better connect the demand and supply side for infrastructure projects in Asia. And we welcome South Asian countries and its diaspora to tap on Infrastructure Asia to connect with best-in-class partners with the right resources and expertise to collaborate on infrastructure projects in South Asia. Uh, my colleague, Minister Indrani Raja, I think, speaking to you uh, later in the convention, and she will be able to have a fuller discussion on this topic with you. Another initiative that Infrastructure Asia will be working on is a capacity-building program with the World Bank Group to strengthen capabilities of infrastructure, project structuring, financing and implementation to better attract international financing and innovation into infrastructure. I think some of the countries have not as much experience in structuring projects in a form which is financeable and which, which, can, and, and which can attract um, uh, the correct partners in order to move the projects forward. Our infrastructure companies in Singapore are already very active in the region. Uh, one example, Semcorp Marine Rigs and Floaters recently collaborated with Shapurji Palonji and Bumi Amada to convert a VLCC, a very large crude carrier, into a floating production, storage and offloading unit, FPSO. And this will be deployed on the east coast of India. And the project will produce up to 90,000 barrels of oil per day and help meet India's significant energy needs. But apart from the physical connectivity, we should also explore new forms of connectivity. And we are here this week in Singapore where we have two important events, the SWITCH, the Singapore Week of Innovation and Technology, and also the FinTech Festival. And so we should enhance digital connectivity and harmonize digital platforms in the region and beyond. This is modern connectivity. And we have, for example, India's RuPay and Singapore's Nets, which launched a tie-up last year to facilitate cross-border payments. India and Singapore are also exploring linking our national single window platforms to facilitate cross-border exchange of trade information digitally. This will smoothen trade, uh, lower the time and the frictions and the cost of trading with each other. Third, developing people. And this is one of, I'm very glad to see many young people in the audience today, particularly those from our institutes of higher learning. I had a quick chat with them, some of them before coming into the hall just now. Developing people is key to all the things that we do. The region's population is projected to grow from 1.8 billion currently to 2.1 billion by 2030, making up one quarter of the world's projected population in 2030. And many will be young people. And education is the key transformational process to take this abundant, latent resource and make it into a creative, productive, future-ready workforce. However, there's much to be done. UNICEF estimates that more than 11 million children of primary school age and more than 20 million children of lower secondary school age in South Asia do not go to school. Closing the education gap will help develop the full human resource potential of South Asia and ensure that the benefits of growth are widely shared. And it's important to do this because the foundations of education last a lifetime. And if we don't get it right from the beginning and do it as quickly as possible, this will continue, will have continuing effects for decades to come. And if we do it right, the potential will be unlocked and it will bloom and flower and bring benefits to the individuals and the countries and the region for decades to come. The diaspora understands the needs and potential of the region and can help to supplement education and training opportunities in a targeted way. One rather moving story 
was of a migrant worker who worked in Singapore for 18 years, and seeing how Singapore's polytechnics have trained graduates with skills that are in high demand. He went home to his hometown in, in uh, Habiganj in Bangladesh to set up the Northeast Ideal Polytechnic Institute in 2012. And as the town's only vocational institute, it has trained two batches of 57 students in civil, electrical, and computer engineering, with 85% of its students having found jobs in the area of study with some lending jobs even before graduation. You might say that, well, 57 students is not a large number given the scale of the issues in South Asia, but every starfish counts. <laughs> and I think every effort that we make is important. I also encourage the diaspora to organize and facilitate more exchanges and partnerships between South Asia and your countries of abode to promote innovation and enterprise, business collaboration, technology transfer and development, and international regulatory best practices. Uh, that last one is a code word for making doing business more easy. <laughs> which I think is common, um, a, a, a common, how shall I say, challenge for many who do business in South Asia. In addition, the diaspora can create more opportunities for youth interactions. These could be educational exchanges, scholarships, internships, and work attachments. And apart from developing our people, you will also enable them to build important bridges and networks from young so that they can take our partnership into the future. And again, in that regard, I'm very happy to see many young people in the audience today. I, I thought when Ambassador Gopi was talking about this new groundbreaking initiative for the convention that he was going to have, and he talked about cricket, I thought he was going to say, we are going to have a women's cricket match. <laughs> Maybe that's an innovation for the future, Gopi. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, there is much to be done. The world is in flux, with growing protectionism and unilateralism. The multilateral trading system and international rules and norms are coming under threat. There are pressing challenges that require all of us to work together. No single country or region can overcome them on its own. This is an opportunity now for us to come together to engage and help shape the architecture of the future, and to strengthen regional and global integration. There is an opportunity now, and we should grasp it. The South Asian diaspora, known for their spirit of determination, hard work and innovation, are our natural partners in this important endeavour. And by working together to enhance economic links, strengthen connectivity, and develop our people to connect to the greater global community, we can create a brighter future for our two regions and peoples and the world. So I wish all of you new ideas, insights and inspiration from this convention, and I look forward to hearing your ideas as well as we have a discussion after this. Thank you very much. <laughs>